There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. The subject is incarnation, and one of the principles of our lives as Christian women who are responsible in some measure for the spiritual life of others is that we have to receive it ourselves before we can give it. We have to live it in our lives and then give it. Receive, live, give is the order. Number one, a definition of incarnation. It is the taking on or being manifested in a human body. Any of you who are Latin students know that the word incarnation comes directly from the two words meaning in the flesh or the enfleshing. God, who is spirit, took on visible, tangible form in the person of Jesus Christ. God was in Christ. And God is also in a Christian. Christ in me, the hope of glory, so that the world may see in us what true godliness looks like. Incarnation is another one of the ways in which we are to do what Jesus Christ did. We talked today about taking up the cross and following him, doing exactly what Jesus did demonstrating for us obedience to his Father. And Jesus is not here anymore in the the flesh. He is not visible and tangible, but you and I are. And so it is in our lives much more what we are and what we do than what we say. The older I get, the more I think about my parents. And my brother Tom and I were talking about this just the other day. We... Tom said that he he thinks when he's not thinking about his teaching, he's thinking about mother and dad. And he made the statement that I don't think I'd ever heard him make before, that, that our father is still to him the icon of what a father truly is supposed to be. We had a wonderful father, and we become more and more appreciative, sadly, long after he's gone. My father died in 1963. My mother didn't die until 1987, but... The older we get, the more I think we appreciate what they meant. And neither one was very verbal about spiritual things, except in the formal way in which they literally taught us to pray, they taught us to sing hymns, they read the Bible to us. But we didn't have family discussions. We didn't have any sharing. That word sharing never occurred in the Howard family vocabulary. my father would have been extremely uncomfortable if people wanted to get around and share their real feelings. <laughs> I mean, if anybody had said to him, now, how do you really feel about that? He would not have known what to say. And if they said, now, tell me how you really, really feel, then he would have known there was something radically wrong. He was a man of few words, even though he was a writer himself, and I have the great blessing of having a number of generations of writers in my background. He didn't talk much. He was a speaker and a writer, but he was a very, very modest man and in a, in a very obvious sense, a very shy man. He was extremely tall and skinny and he only had one eye. He had lost his eye at the age of 13 through disobedience. You can imagine that we children heard that story many times. <laughs> but um, he was convinced that no woman would ever marry him because he was so ugly with his glass eye. And he got a very beautiful wife. But we think, Tom and I talk about these things constantly. He's the only brother that lives near me. What they did for us, what they taught us, and it was mostly what they were, rather than what they said, mostly what they did. We were talking one day about the wickedness of breaking promises to children. 
it is a terrible evil to tell a child that he will be punished if he does such and such and then not punish him. You are destroying the moral fabric of that child. Another thing, of course, would be to make a promise about something good that you were going to do with him and then fail to keep that promise. You ch tell the child that you're going to take him somewhere to the beach or to the woods on Saturday and then a friend comes along and asks you to go and play golf and so you go and play golf and tell your son that you'll go next week. Tom and I agreed we never once remember that happening in our family. If our, if our parents said, if you do that, you're going to get a spanking, you can be sure we got the spanking. And if they told us that we were going to do something, then of course, unless it was some unavoidable reason for not going, they did not break their promises. And they never threatened us. They never made empty threats or empty promises. But these were ingrained in their character, in the very fiber and the mold in which each of them was raised. They were the incarnation to us of what godliness looks like. And the more I hear from other people who knew my mother, uh, the more they, the more I learn of what a blessing she was to many people besides her own, own children. For example, my friend Robin Davis, who now has five lovely children, who I guess the youngest is probably about ten, eight or ten maybe, and Robin told me that she had gone to my mother one time for advice about her first child. And she said, I had him sitting on my lap, and he was about 18 months old. And she said, the whole time, for the first half hour or so that we were talking, he was taking my glasses off. He kept reaching for my glasses and taking them off. And I kept taking them out of his hand and putting them back. And she said, finally, your mother said to me, Robin, did you not know that you can teach that child not to touch your glasses? And Robin said to me, I didn't know that. I had no idea you could teach a baby not to touch something. She said, your mother taught me the most important lesson of my life in t training children. So my mother was an incarnation of godliness to her. Now, Jesus was, of course, the pure and perfect incarnation or icon. An icon is an image of God. First, John 1, Gospel of John 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We often hear people read this, and the Word was God. I, th I prefer the emphasis, the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Verse 14, the word became flesh. And this, of course, is where this word incarnation comes from and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And a beautiful passage, Hebrews 1, verse 3, the Son, S-O-N, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The exact representation of God's being. What Jesus was, God is. What Jesus did, God did. And Jesus repeated again and again, I speak nothing from myself. I speak the words that I've been given from my Father. I do nothing by myself. I do the works that I see the Father do. And perhaps that was a lesson that he had learned as a little boy in the carpenter shop watching his foster father, Joseph, using the ads and the hammer and the file and the saw, learning to do what he saw his father do. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. And in chapter 2, verse 3, it says, He was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death. And I trust you're going to re recognize the connections of things all the time. You heard me talk today about death 
being the prerequisite to glory. And he was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Amazing grace, again, that he was willing to be enfleshed, to become that helpless little child, to grow up as any little boy grows up. Don't we wish that we had far more details about those growing up years? We only know one extremely important thing, that when he was 12 years old, he made a specific break with his father and mother and took upon himself spiritual responsibility. And you remember how they found him after three days in the temple, and he was confounding the experts in the law. And when his mother chided him, as you and I would have done, why did you treat us like this? We have sought you sorrowing. You remember what Jesus said, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? To me, this is a very important point to get get through our heads in raising our children. When a boy reaches the age of 12, he is in the transition between childhood, not and teenage. There is no teenager in the Bible. Childhood and adulthood. That is the transition. And we need to be much more serious about understanding that these children now are making a break away from us. They're going to move into what sometimes are the silent years. They're going to move into examining all the things that they've swallowed, hook, line, and sinker for the first 12 years and asking all kinds of questions that may upset you and think this child is undermining all the faith that we've tried to put into him. No, he's not. Never underestimate the spiritual acuity of your children. I distinctly remember at the age of 10, looking at, the, looking at myself in the mirror and saying, I know that these grown-ups don't know what's going on in my, my head, but I know that I am responsible to God. I knew that at the age of 10. Jesus knew at the age of 12 that he had to be about his father's business. And I think that was one of the swords that pierced Mary's heart that Simeon had spoken of. There were a number, and of course, at the very end, those wonderful words, there stood by the cross of Jesus, Mary his mother, not there lay in a sobbing heap at the foot of the cross. Mary had been strengthened throughout all those 33 years learning of him. He was her savior too, you know. This baby whom she had nursed at her breast and carried in her womb began to teach her. And as we said today, the the very last word that we know she said was, do whatever he tells you. Since the children have flesh and blood, this is Hebrews 2.14, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, He might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Verse, uh, chapter 4, 15, these are all from Hebrews. Jesus was described as one who has been tempted in every way, and he could not have been tempted without human flesh. So all through the Old Testament, we have God revealing himself, first of all, through creation, then revealing himself as he speaks to Adam and Eve and lays down some rules for them, then God speaking through the prophets. He spoke through creation. He spoke directly to people. He spoke through the prophets to his people Israel. But now we find God revealing himself in human flesh. And you can listen to the radio. You can read books. You can read sermons. You can listen to what people say. But... The most important thing is seeing what they do. Being able to understand what they believe by what they are. And that is the responsibility that is laid upon you and me. They are looking to us. And of course, that's a very uncomfortable position for us to be in. It's a very hazardous position for us to be in. And we all know far too many stories 
of the collapses, the moral collapses of people who have been looked up to by hundreds of thousands. It's an awesome and and solemn responsibility. But I do believe that people have a right to expect that we are living by what we're talking. Woe be to us if we do not enflesh, incarnate the truth that God has given to us. The Bible says that teachers will be judged by a far higher standard than others. That's scary, isn't it? But why shouldn't we be? We have been given so much, and it is increasingly sobering to me as I study genealogy on my father's side of the family. I can't go back very far on my mother's side. Realizing that to me, much has been given, and of me, much will be required. Will I be able to meet that test? May God help me to incarnate the things I talk about. Point two, the chalice, C-H-A-L-I-C-E. Mary gave her body to be the chalice in which the life of God was to be formed and born. You know what a chalice is, a cup. And the one thing that Mary did is the one thing that you and I are meant to do, every one of us, every day, no matter where we are or what the circumstances. And that is to bear Christ into this world. That is the truth of God. We are meant to bear the life of Christ within us. Amazing, isn't it? To think that God has created us to be chalices. Now, of course, this, is, this applies to both men and women. The life of Christ is meant to be manifest in men, but I think we women have the special privilege of being given a much deeper understanding, a more mysterious understanding of what this means, because every month we have a reminder that we were created to be life bearers. And that token of blood shows that life comes out of death. That's what blood signifies. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and when blood is shed, it means death. And when the month comes around and the blood is shed, you know that there is no possibility of life during that next month. I have to repeat this because it's such a tremendous and overwhelming thing to me. But the one thing that Mary did is the one thing that you and I are meant to do, every one of us, every day, no matter where we are or what the circumstances, and that is to bear Christ into the world. And they, the world is desperately looking for holy lives. They don't know that that's what they're looking for. They wouldn't be asking, where can I find the holy lives? But there's something about the recognition that comes when once in a while... God makes a very holy person very widely known. And I think Mother Teresa is that icon for very many people. Uh, you may argue about her theology, but you cannot argue about her motivation in what she does on the streets of, of Calcutta. When Mal Malcolm Muggridge re uh, interviewed her for a movie years ago, he put to her the obvious question, why do you do this? go all over the streets of Cal Calcutta in these filthy, dark, miserable places and pick up the dying people and the most um, distorted images of Christ that you can imagine. People with leprosy, people crawling with sores and bugs and everything. And her answer was very simple. She said, we, like, we want to do for these people what we would do for Christ if we could see him taking her words from Matthew 25, 40, inasmuch as you've done it for one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it for me. And he accepts that. And you remember that when he said that to the disciples, they said, when did we ever see you hungry? When did we ever see you naked? When did we ever visit you in prison? When did we ever feed you? And that was his answer. If you did it for these, you did it for me. Whatever you do, whether it's evil or good, he receives. We have to be careful. 
So the story of the assignment of this chalice, of course, is in the first chapter of Luke. Such a beautiful story. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Have you noticed how many times in the scriptures the the appearance of an angel brings fear and trouble? You don't find any sentimentality about the angels in the scripture. There are no cute little cherubs flying around, and they certainly were not female. They appeared, when they appeared in a visible form, it was always in the form of a man, at least as far as we know. There was, there's very few descriptions of them, but the response would indicate that this person to whom, to whom the angel came recognized this person to whom they were speaking and the person spoke their language. It wasn't any heavenly gobbledygook. She was troubled and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be, but the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I never really thought much about the importance of that announcement about Elizabeth until just fairly recently. I don't know how I could have been so obtuse as to have skipped over it, but that was just a wonderful and completely provable confirmation that what the angel was telling her was going to happen was not an impossibility, because if even her cousin Elizabeth was going to have a child in her old age, that was certainly an impossible thing. But nothing is impossible with God. And that was just the encouragement that Mary needed to be able to say, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. A humble girl in a little house on a quiet street in a small village visited some one day as she was perhaps weaving or baking or sweeping by this ministering spirit you know the bible describes angels as ministering spirits and he became visible and audible which is to me a mystery he came from highest heaven into this village in nazareth and said as one translation puts it hail thou who art highly favored full of grace and of course if any of you are or used to be catholics why you certainly know those words Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Those were the angel's exact words. And she learns that she's to become the mother of the Most High. We talked this morning about her perfect acceptance, no reservations, only one reasonable question. And if you'd like to find two other verses that are very similar to what Mary responded, you can look up Psalm 119, 24 and Second Samuel 15. 13 and the following verses Psalm 119 24 and 2 Samuel 15 13 I won't take time to read those tonight but I think it's three times in that 15th chapter 2 Samuel that someone makes a total commitment by faith an, an unreasonable commitment as unreasonable as Mary's to love God is to love his will. Mary's was the purposeful emptiness of a virginal heart, someone has said. The purposeful 
emptiness of a, of a virginal heart, not a formless em- emptiness without meaning. She was the flower-like chalice into which the purest water of humanity was to be poured. She surrendered her body to be the chalice, and you, when you become pregnant, are doing exactly the same thing. It doesn't happen to be the Son of God, but you are cooperating with God's creative work by offering to him your body. And the more deeply we understand the truth of this and its spiritual significance, the more horrifying the terrible wickedness of abortion appears because that person is then absolutely refusing to cooperate in God's wonderful creative work. This same writer says, she she was the warm nest rounded to the shape of humanity to receive the divine little bird. Isn't that lovely? The warm nest rounded to the shape of humanity to receive the divine little bird. Strangely enough, those who complain the loudest of the emptiness of their lives are usually people whose lives are overcrowded, filled with trivial details, plans, desires, ambitions, and unsatisfied cravings for passing pleasures, doubts, anxieties, and fears. And these sometimes are further overlaid with exhausting pleasures. You know anything about exhausting pleasures? Which are a futile attempt to forget how pointless their lives are. That's the end of that quote. Mary had a pure aim, a single purpose, a spiritual hunger. And I feel confident that that could be said of every one of us here tonight. I don't think you would be here if that were not the desire of your heart. Yet, and here's the part where the rubber meets the road, ladies. This is where you ought to be able to make the application of these tremendous theological, philosophical, spiritual truths. The mystery which Mary was to bear in the chalice of her body entailed not solely spiritual things, but very unmistakably physical things. Conception, pregnancy, and birth, followed by all that loving and caring for a baby means, including in her time the required ceremony of circumcision. All of this reminds us that it was the enfleshing of God himself in radical limitation, the Greek word is the kenosis, the emptying of himself to become a totally helpless baby. And there is no baby in the animal kingdom as helpless as a human baby. How many of you know that beautiful Christmas carol once in Royal David City? Stood a lonely cattle shed where a mother laid her baby in a manger for a bed. Mary, Jesus was that little child. No, Mary was that mother mild, Jesus Christ, her little child. But this is the stanza that I want you to listen to. And through all his wondrous childhood, he would honor and obey, love and watch the lowly maiden in whose gentle arms he lay. Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good, as he. Does that describe your children? (laughs) Mild, obedient, good as he. For he is our childhood's pattern. Day by day, like us, he grew. He was little, weak, and helpless. Tears and smiles, like us, he knew. And he feeleth for our sadness, and he shareth in our gladness. Remember that there is no dichotomy between secular work and spiritual work. There wasn't for Mary. There shouldn't be for us. We do serve the Lord Christ in that little child that God gives to you. And if God doesn't give you children, God will give you spiritual children. Let's not forget that. And, of course, the time comes when the nest is emptied, and if God has given you children in the biological sense, they fly away. And what are you supposed to do then? We are supposed to be spiritual mothers. 
We are to continue our mothering because we were born with the physical evidence that that's what we were created for. Whether God ever gives us the privilege of bearing physically a human child, he will give us the privilege of being spiritual mothers. And it is required of us, it says in Titus 2, 3 to 5, that older women are to teach the younger women. Where are these older women? What are they doing? Why are they not teaching women how to love their children? Why are the children running wild in so many churches? Not to mention in schools and the neighborhoods. Because young mothers don't know what to do and nobody's taught them. Why are there so many divorces? Because the older women are not teaching the younger women to love their husbands. And the last stanza of that lovely little hymn takes us from the cattle shed to heaven at God's right hand on high, when like stars his children crowned, all in white, shall wait around. And the Christian life is a continuum of visible, tangible things on this level and invisible things on another level. Faith is a two-world word. We live here down among the tangible, visible things and the washing machines that break down and the roast that burns and the diapers that are piled up and the mail that we can't get around to answering and the ironing and all the rest of it. These are all part of our spiritual training and all part of our spiritual worship. As I present this physical body as a living sacrifice, it is an act of spiritual worship. As you tend that tiny child with all the mess and all the sleepless nights and all the sacrifice that it means. It is an act of spiritual worship. And the Lord receives it as though it were done to him. And that baby would not only be fed at Mary's breast and learn at her feet and in the carpenter's shop, but he would one day feel the blindfold, the ropes, the lash, the thorns, and finally the blood and the nails and the splinters of the cross. Some of the most ancient hymns of the church speak of dear wood and dear iron, meaning the cross and the nails, which becomes dear to us, sacred, awesome, much more than ordinary wood and ordinary iron, because it was the method of execution of our Savior. That's what the Incarnation was about. The Lord of the universe, given the body of an ordinary, vulnerable, mortal man, in order that he might suffer, in order that he might be totally emptied and sacrificed and annihilated for the life of the world. Jesus said, the, blood, the, the bread that I will give is my body, and I will give it for the life of the world. What bread do you and I have to give to the world, primarily? Our bodies. And we are meant to be broken bread and poured out wine. One of my dear friends, who is an earnest, lovely woman, who has certainly had spiritual responsibility for many, and she has four children of her own. She wrote me a letter last summer saying that she was she had decided to be a very private person during the summer. She's a pastor's wife, and of course a pastor's wife is in a peculiarly visible position, fishbowl sort of thing. And she had decided to be a very private person. Well, of course, being one of her spiritual mothers, I had to chide her a little bit about that because I thought that it would be a good, a good idea to remind her that we really don't have a right, any of us, to be a private person, no matter how much we might want to. Now, don't misinterpret this as an extreme. When Jesus needed to get away and into the hills alone or with his disciples, he did so. And certainly the Lord does want us to arrange quiet. We must do that. We must arrange quiet and solitude. If we don't manage to arrange any other kind of, what shall we call it? I don't like to call it relaxation or recreation, but a change from all the busyness of the world. 
But Jesus was hounded for three years, the only three years that we know anything about of his life. He, his sleeve was constantly being plucked by people, asking him for things, demanding things. The Pharisees coming and arguing with him about everything he ever said, and people who hated him, and people who doubted him, some mocked him, some believed. And he was just available. He was just available for those three years. So if we are willing to be broken bread and poured out wine, I don't think we can choose to be quite that uh, unavailable, that we can call ourselves private people, for the reason that I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. I'm one who does like solitude and would be very happy staying at home practically all the time. I'm not given that privilege, but I'm given many other privileges. Let me not mislead you into thinking that I feel I'm suffering by having to travel around and meet wonderful people like you. Philippians 1, no, Philippians 2, 5 to 9. We read a part of that earlier today, so I won't read it again. The kenosis passage, the passage in which it describes very clearly the utter self-abandonment. He who being in the very nature of God made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And he quite literally did that, didn't he, when he took a towel and got down on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. God became man that you and I might be changed, not into storybook princesses, but nor wafted into another world or freed from the limitations of a physical body, but transformed into saints. That's what we're supposed to be, transformed into saints. And I hope that every one of you here knows some saints and has been blessed by some. I have known quite a few in my life, truly holy people who have set examples for me and have enfleshed and incarnated for me the life of God. And maybe we'll have time to talk about some of those people. It is not through change of circumstance, but a radical change of vision, of attitude and response. And one of the ancient responses of the church has been sorsum corda. You Latin students know that that means hearts upward, or as it's usually translated into English, lift up your hearts. And when you are feeling down in the dumps and everything is falling to pieces and you just know that you can't carry on anymore, you can move from this visible earth up into heaven in a split second by just lifting up your heart. And I happen to go to a church where the pastor says to us in a loud, joyful voice, lift up your hearts. And the response of the congregation is, we lift them up to the Lord. And I can remember, especially when my husband was dying of cancer, just the wonderful lift that it gave me to be able to get away from all his pain and suffering just for that one hour and be able to go and in the company of other Christians say, we lift them up to the Lord. Just lift up my heart. God had revealed himself through his works of creation, then the word. He spoke to Adam and Noah and Abraham and the prophets, and now he was revealed in human flesh. A man, a Jewish man, born at a certain time under Pontius Pilate in a cow house to a certain modest, quiet teenager. And today he continues to reveal himself in the world through human flesh, you and me. Human examples multiple revelations of himself, different personalities, different sizes, different ages, different ethnic groups, asking us at every juncture, do you love me? Will you hear my words? Will you accept my work in your life? Will you love my will? It's easy to sing about how much we love God. But sometimes I think the Lord is saying to us in a still small voice, don't tell me, show me. You must love his will. Mary heard his word, recognized his will, surrendered to his action with utter self-abandonment. Now remember that Mary was still the same girl whom Joseph cherished 
But her whole human nature, body and soul, was the material in which the will of God was executed. She was a chalice, a God-bearer. She went forward with her plan to marry Joseph, to live the life of a carpenter's wife, just what she had planned to do before she had any idea that anything extraordinary was going to happen. God didn't jerk her out of those circumstances and put her in a palace because she was cooperating with him and bringing the Son of God into the world. It was in a village, in the same house, with the same husband. You and I, not you and I, Mary, was not asked to live a holy life in a monastery, alone with God, perhaps in some cave in the desert. She shared an ordinary life with an ordinary man. She was not asked to neglect her simple human tenderness, her love for an earthly man, just because her unborn child was God. On the contrary, the hands and feet, the heart, the waking, the sleeping, and the eating that were forming Christ in her was to form him in the service to Joseph. She still had her obligation to her husband, and that was holy work and the incarnation of the life of God for an ordinary man in an ordinary home. Hers was a pure love directed toward unity and the good of the be- of the beloved. That's what love is about. Unity, the intention of unity, and concern for the good of the beloved. And as far as we know anything about Mary, that was a thread that ran through her whole life. Undoubtedly, it was manifest in her relationship to her husband, and it was manifest in that shining testimony for all of us Christians through all the years of human history, of Christian history. She proved that she loved God because she loved his will. And there we stop for the evening. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today and will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.